lunch. We talked earlier about the fact that so much waste in industrialized countries occurs because we as consumers simply aren't paying attention. We buy more than we need and we throw groceries away perhaps when they simply no longer look appealing. Or maybe the sell-by date is getting close and we don't want to uh, offend our families as squeamish eaters. So much perfectly edible food ends up in the waste bin. But that does not have to be the end of the story, as our next speaker has demonstrated with his award-winning campaign, Feeding the 5,000. Please give a very warm welcome to the winner of the International Sophie Prize, the author of the book, Waste, Uncovering the Global Food Scandal, Mr. Tristram Stewart. And I'll just say that we did offer to let uh, Tristram deliver his remarks uh, seated because he has not been feeling well. So we are all the more grateful for the fact that you did join us this morning. Um, I'd better start by making a quick correction. I don't focus mainly on consumer food waste. In fact, I think it's been massively exaggerated as, as a problem we just heard um, from Tron Timmermans. Uh, that according to official European figures, around 49% of the food waste happens at the consumer level. I regard those figures as bogus and inaccurate, mainly because they leave off uh, a lot of the food waste that does happen further up the supply chain in slaughterhouses, wasted fish at sea, and all of the food waste that I'm going to talk about now in um, foreign countries, but which happen as a result of the policies of the European supermarkets principally. And the reason why I campaign on those issues particularly is that I think these are gratuitous causes of food waste, but ones that can be really relatively easily changed. So I've started on a little bit of a digression just to um, clear up a, a misconception that might otherwise have arisen. Um, so Feeding the 5000 is uh, a way of launching a national food waste uh, campaign, engaging uh, people, not just in terms of how they can reduce food waste in their homes, but how they can put pressure on the industry to reduce food waste in the supply chain. We have had some really nice successes uh, in the UK and in other countries. Um, one of the campaigns that we've been running is on ugly fruit and vegetables. And this is a big heap of ugly fruit and vegetables, all of which would have been wasted. You might look at them and think, well, <laughs> what's ugly about those carrots, for example? And the point is that, you know, carrots are being wasted just because they're not perfectly straight or um, because they have very minor skin blemishes. And that's owing to the cosmetic standards laid down by the supermarket. So farmers are very often wasting a huge amount of food that would otherwise be wasted. We have done a public awareness raising campaign about that. And in, um, since 2009, when we launched this campaign, it's become the fastest growing sector of the fresh produce market, ugly fruit and vegetables. Now, that may sound funny, but uh, in 2012, that saved roughly 300,000 tonnes of produce just on UK farms. And that's as a result of people being more willing to buy them, supermarkets who I've visited uh, farmers with to look at what's being wasted, think about how that can be marketed. And we have really um, changed the market now. Obviously, the weather was a, a very big contributing factor to uh, what happened in 2012. But farmers that I've been speaking to over the last six months say that there really has been an uh, attitudinal shift in the industry. One carrot producer, major carrot producer for supermarkets that I spoke to a few weeks ago, says he now sells 20% more of his carrots than he did just a few years ago. So it's something that we really can change. This is a, a picture of feeding the 5,000 event. Um, Feeding 5000 aims to promote the activities of all the partner charities that get involved. But one of the things that um, no one seemed to be doing anything about when we uh, launched uh, Feeding 5000 um, those years ago was waste at farm level. And it's those cosmetic outgrades and also food that is being left in the field and not harvested because uh, the supermarket changes its order at the last minute and the farmer is left with crops. And no one was tackling this, so we had to set this initiative up ourselves. It's called the Gleaning Network, and we take volunteers out to farms, harvest the stuff that's being left in fields, and then give that to charities for redistribution. And if the charities haven't got the capacity to take it all, we find secondary markets for it. It's a nice uh, feel-good um, 
kind of activity that saves food, feeds hungry people, but also communicates on the root causes of food waste. Uh, the most recent campaign that we've been running is called The Pig Idea, and this is uh, really a campaign that says any food that is not fit for human consumption um, should at least be used for the next best purpose, which is feeding livestock, and in particular pigs. And in order to do that more effectively, we need to change the European legislation that currently bans the feeding of catering waste and all animal byproducts to pigs and chickens, because that's what we domesticated these pigs for uh, several thousand years ago. And the result is that we now um, import 40 million tons of soy from South America to Europe every year to feed our livestock instead. And at the same time, we pay billions of pounds to get rid of food waste, which actually would make very good livestock feed. Um, when I started working on food waste and was writing my book uh, back in 2007, 2008, it used to really irritate me that everyone kept on going on about plastic bags and plastic packaging. And I kept on saying, come on, guys, look, a plastic bag, yeah, OK, it's a real nuisance, but..." Actually, what we should be focusing on is the waste of food on the inside of that plastic bag. The environmental impacts of food waste are far greater than the waste uh, of plastic. And I've been really pleased to see how globally the shift has uh, happened, and we are focusing much more on food waste. It's a really good thing. But I now think it's gone a little bit too far. So to address... Uh, this problem. And the problem that I'm talking about is basically plastic packaging companies presenting themselves as the heroes of food waste, as the people who are in the best position to tackle global food waste. And of course the Interpact Conference and the Safe Food uh, Congress here are, are really a classic case in point of that. So I'm probably going to lose a few friends now, but uh, I'll carry on anyway. So our latest uh, initiative is called Invisipac. Um, have I got that slide? Yeah. So Invisipac, thinking outside the box. This is our answer to ecological packaging to save food waste. Invisipac um, is a kind of packaging that has zero mass and zero carbon impact. It allows you to get very close up to the food, really sort of feel that you're holding and smelling food as it should be. As you can see, what uh, we've got here is um, some conventional packaging on the left-hand side, and then our rival Invisipack uh, on the right-hand side. And as you can see, you know, it really, it really f helps you feel a bit closer to the food, as real food, not just as sort of something wrapped in shiny plastic. We've got apples in the Invisipack here, um, and some bananas. Uh, as you can see, you know the. The conventional packaging solution uh, by Morrison's, one of the UK's big supermarkets for that banana, it kind of, I mean, it could be said to be doubling up rather. The banana has this, this lovely natural packaging on it. And, uh, and that's what we like to celebrate with the Invisipack project. Um, and potatoes, of course. Uh, yeah. So, to come to a bit more of a serious point, I think everyone's probably seen claims like this being made by individual companies, by trade representations, and usually when I read a claim like this, UK plastics packaging manufacturers are well placed to export ideas, technology and products to the global market. At the same time, they are well positioned to help resolve, resolve a global crisis, the global crisis being food waste. And I read that and then I think, well, what have they based these claims on? And usually, um, so, so there have been some, some scholarly, scientific uh, bits of research conducted to show how plastic uh, packaging can reduce food waste. And usually uh, those uh, bits of research, and certainly the way in which they're interpreted by the marketing uh, groups of big plastic packaging companies, um, is, is really not very robust at all tackle the first claim made. The first claim made is that plastic packaging can increase the shelf life of a product. Now, it may seem that increasing the shelf life would naturally lead to a reduction in food waste, but actually the, the link is not as obvious as you might think. 
It may simply mean that you can bring strawberries from further afield. You can bring them from Kenya because you've got plastic packaging and it can last uh, over that long journey. Whereas without the plastic packaging, you couldn't do that. You would have to rely on locally produced seasonal strawberries, for example. Does it actually show that food waste as a whole has been reduced? It might mean that a supermarket can stock a piece of produce for longer, making it more profitable for them. But again, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that the packaged product is going to be wasted less. And most of the research that has been conducted does not interrogate these different dynamics in anything like the kind of rigor that would be required um, to show that plastic packaging reduces food waste. Now look, I, I'm not saying that pack packaging doesn't have a role. Of course it does. But I think it's being over-egged and sometimes in really not very responsible ways. And I, one of the things that really bugged me actually at the launch of the Safe Food Conference back in 2011 here in Dusseldorf is we had a lot of representative of plastic packaging companies. And I asked them the question, you know, that their, their business model, let's be clear about it. At the moment, you know, Europe, the market is quite saturated for plastic packaging. Pretty much everything that you can plastic, uh, packaging plastic is being packaged at the moment. The growth areas of industry are in Af Africa and Asia. And the ostensible purpose of these marketing campaigns is to bring their products, to wrap uh, what are currently unwrapped uh, products with, with plastic. And, you know, they've obviously cottoned on to the idea that if they can say that it reduces food waste, it makes them more acceptable to the public. And we'll stop thinking about the side effects of plastic um, you can see a picture here of uh, the kind of waste disaster that happens when plastic is brought into a country that doesn't have the infrastructure for recycling. It doesn't even have the infrastructure for landfilling the plastic, so it just starts clogging out rivers. Um, I was actually living in India in 2001 when the plastics lobby convinced the Indian government to replace what had been traditionally used on all of the train uh, services. So they used to use these reusable metal tallies and clay cups. And that's what you got your food in on a train in India. And a lot of food is eaten on trains. And the plastics lobby convinced the Indian government at that time that it was more hygienic to use plastic packaging. But of course, that same lobby didn't say, and we need to put in place uh, a waste management policy that will deal with all of this plastic. So this is the kind of thing that you see on train tracks across the whole of India. Um, solving the global food crisis one package at a time. I mean, it, it's, it's just got too gimmicky, hasn't it? This is the kind of thing that happens uh, with plastic packaging when it's not uh, being managed properly. So birds, uh, and it's really a widespread problem globally, birds pick up bits of plastic and their stomachs get filled up with it fish do it too. And of course, not only does that mean that the wildlife consuming all of this plastic dies because its stomach fills up with indigestible bits of plastic, um, it actually contaminates our food. Um, I think the United Nations Environment Program have just launched a new uh, initiative last year on uh, endocrine disruptors. We all know that endocrine disruptors, which essentially interfere with the hormonal um, cycle of humans and, and other wildlife, uh, a lot of those endocrine disruptors come from plastics, things like um, bisphenol A. And EPA has been found in, in fish uh, and fish products across the world. And it's, it's from fish eating plastics very often that, that this arises. And I think all of these things need to be taken into account. But to really um, emphasize the point that I, I want to make about plastic packaging, it's being proposed as a solution to food waste. And very often, as I say, yeah, you can show that it extends shelf life or whatever. But there are lots of examples where the plastic packaging itself is causing food waste directly. So um, this is a site that presumably most of us are fairly familiar with, Ken Beans. And uh, we see them in supermarkets across the whole of Europe. And you'll notice the word trimmed on these, on these green beans from Kenya. Now, it's conventional when you grow a green bean to take the, the top and the tail off, right? You, you're with me. Uh, but you can see from this picture um, that 
it's actually not just the top and the tail that are being taken off these beans. That plastic packaging has a certain length. And when Kenyan farmers grow green beans, um, obviously, you know, they don't grow to that certain length. They grow in lots of different lengths. You can't do anything about that. And so to fit them into those plastic packages, they have to trim off uh, sometimes 30, 40 percent of the bean. This is a photograph I took when I was in Kenya with UNEP last year. Um, and we'd been tasked with feeding the governing council gala dinner with food that otherwise would have been wasted in Kenya. And you think, well, come on, in Kenya, surely they don't gratuitously waste food in the way that we do in European countries. In fact, they do. And it's, in, it's very often in the supply chains of European supermarkets that you found, find the most gratuitous sources of food waste. So one farmer we visited was wasting 40% of all the food that he grew. And that was a cos combination of the cosmetic standards, so the beans had to be that certain length. If you think about it, that's 30 to 40% of the land and water in Kenya, where both those resources are really quite scarce, being wasted in order to fit a bean into a package that suits the requirements of European supermarkets. I think this needs to be balanced against the claims being made for packaging in the food waste revolution. Um, the other cause of food waste uh, in this supply chain is when supermarkets in Europe cancel an order at the very last minute. In the UK that's now illegal and it's the intention of our organisation to find specific examples of where supermarkets in the UK have been doing this. They cancel an order, the farmer who has grown the food, pay for it to be harvested, even sometimes packed in the supermarket's packaging and flown all the way to the United Kingdom and then the order is cancelled and the food waste and the cost of it are on the producer's hands. That's now illegal in the UK, as I say, under the Groceries Code Adjudicator Act. Um, but at the moment, it does cause an awful lot of food waste. This depot, export depot outside Nairobi, was wasting 20 tonnes of good fresh food every single day. And the waste contractors who came to collect these waste beans, so-called waste beans, all of which are perfectly fit for human consumption, had to sign a contract saying that they would ensure that none of the food ended up being eaten by people. They had to ensure that none of the food in a country with millions of hungry people got eaten by people. We're paying for that at the moment. Uh, another example of packaging, uh, carrots, again carrots, only of a certain length can fit into this packaging. Carrots don't grow uh, in that uniform way. Um, and this is, a, when I first visited this carrot production unit back in 2000, I think, seven, I went to this bin uh, and I said to the farmer, I said, um, these must be your premium range carrots for the supermarkets, right? And he said, no, no, these are the rejects. This is what we can't sell. You have to be an expert to tell the difference between these carrots. These carrots, most of them are too long to fit in that packaging. So again, the link between packaging and food waste is often the reverse of what's often being claimed. And then finally, you've got to take into account the role of packaging in food waste management. Now, food waste is, yeah, it's a real shame when food is wasted. But then, as we all know, down the hierarchy, there are secondary uses for food waste that can recover at least some of the value of the food being wasted, whether it's feeding pigs and chickens or at least composting and anaerobic digestion. But as anyone involved in the sector knows, the principal barrier to a cost-effective food waste recycling mechanism is all the packaging. You, you can imagine, inside all of that packaging is something with nutritional value, or at least value as compost, but it's got a whole load of plastic, so you have to buy a depackaging machine. And depackaging machines are not 100% effective. There's a toleration limit when you're producing compost or producing pig feed from waste that allows you to have, I think it's 0.02% of plastic left over in the stuff that you're going to feed your pigs or put onto your field. Now, if you're putting plastic containing compost onto a field, which we are doing increasingly, and point, even just 0.02% of it is plastic, over years, that 0.02% which doesn't buy the grain will accumulate. And I don't think anyone's really sort of taken that bull by the horns. This is one of the solutions to that problem that I visited in Japan. This is the Agrigaya Food Waste Recycling Unit. They're separating out the edible stuff for pigs and the packaging. As you can see, that's, that's adding huge costs. And unsurprisingly, Agrigaya has gone bust if they can't afford to pay all those people to depackage all of that stuff. So, Invisipack, 
It doesn't lend itself to long supply chains. It doesn't lend itself to unseasonal fruits and vegetables. It lends itself to local seasonal supply chains where produce from a particular area can be supplied to the people living there in a fresh state that keeps us connected with the food that we rely on and with the land that it's grown on. And this is the kind of uh, pilot program that we were running with in VisiPack. And I'd, I'd welcome anyone to, to try it out next time you have an option between Invisipack and plastic packaging. And to end finally with an invitation tomorrow night uh, in Dusseldorf in the Zuitbetstrusstrasse. Anyway, you can see the address there. It's in Dusseldorf, it's a Schnippel disco. Uh, and we have um, collected a lot of food that would have otherwise been wasted from the area around Dusseldorf. And we invite everyone to come and help prepare it, turn it into a delicious meal to the sound of music, dancing, and good fun. And um, before uh, the Schnippel Disco tomorrow night, there is a lunch laid on for everyone here. Uh, and a lot of that food that you're going to be uh, invited to eat is food that would have been wasted. And our organization, Feeding the 5000, has been working with some of the fantastic local organizations here in Dusseldorf to locate that food waste and recover what we can. And in particular, I want to say thank you to Valentin Turn, who is the director, as I'm sure many of you know, of Taste the Waste. His more um, recent initiative is about sustainable and local food production. And he wants, with Taste of Heimat, to bring consumers in Germany uh, and elsewhere uh, closer to their food production and to provide a platform, a little bit like food sharing, provided a platform for food waste. Taste of Heimat is going to produce a, a platform to link uh, consumers with local food producers. And his team um, have been working very hard with us to source the food waste. And, and uh, I really invite everyone to come and enjoy a delicious meal, lunchtime now in the canteen. And if you feel like getting more involved, come to the Schnipple Disco tomorrow night. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that very thought-provoking, fascinating um, discussion. And uh, regardless under whose auspices we meet, Safe Food is absolutely dedicated to making sure we have productive debate and critical exchange. So we are very, very glad that you could be with us, particularly given the fact that you don't feel terribly well today. So many, many thanks to you. And indeed, we can now taste what would have been waste at our lunch, which will be in the pavilion that is basically uh, outside, but you will see signs and you will find hostesses who will help guide us there. And let us meet back here in exactly one hour, please. We are a bit behind schedule, but if we're really prompt in one hour, we should be able to get back on track. So many thanks to Tristan Stewart. Good luck uh, to you in your ventures and good appetit to all of you in the audience.